change breakfast tomorrow. You've finally been fasting overnight. Insulin has come down. The last thing you want to do is spike your insulin with a starchy, sugary breakfast. Tragically, breakfast is almost just a dessert nowadays. If you do want to eat, then let it be either fast through breakfast, um, like a drink. Uh, I like to drink a cup of yerba mate. Uh, fast, drink some coffee or tea, uh, and uh, which is not uh, not going to break your fasted state. Even if you put a little butter, I don't consider that as breaking a fasted state because I define fast as the endocrinology, the, the nutrients rather than the calories. Uh, but that's a topic for another time. But uh, or, or don't consume anything. But if you do, then if you do want to eat, then let it be the low glycemic load vegetables um, and berries and then more protein and fat. So do whatever you can do to keep your insulin in check for as long as possible until say lunch, the longer the insulin is low, the more you're improving your insulin sensitivity and the more you are allowing that metabolic flexibility where the human hybrid burning glucose or sugar burning or fat burning, it's insulin that dictates that fuel. And most people are stuck in sugar burning mode because they never bring their insulin down long enough to shift over to fat burning. So you get to get into this fat burning state, enhancing metabolic flexibility, and you're improving your insulin sensitivity. So my one piece of advice, change breakfast and change it tomorrow. So you want to extend that, yeah. that, that state where you're, you're basically improving insulin sensitivity. Yes, that's right. Okay. So the meal frequency it sounds like, you know, the more you're each time you're elevating, each time you're having an insulin response, that insulin is then you're, you're getting into the fat storage. Yeah. And you will get mode. hungry. And you yeah. Get so, so as much as we highlighted that 2021 study, what I ought to have done is highlight the work of Dr. David Ludwig, um, Kara Ebeling and others and Shai et al. in New England Journal of Medicine in, in 2012. There are there's so many decades worth of evidence showing that as much as we had that one study suggesting, well, the insulin, higher insulin group didn't have less hunger. Yeah, there's a lot of evidence showing the opposite. So where you you end up creating this roller coaster of glycemia and hunger where the person eats a starchy, sugary breakfast, which let's face it, most breakfasts are these days. They have this big spike. And then when you go high, you inevitably go low. And then when you go low, hunger comes again, even though you may still literally have food in your stomach and yet your brain is starting to sense, well, I'm hungry because the overall amount of energy in the blood has gone down, even though there's plenty of stuff still in the stomach, but it stimulates hunger. That's David Ludwig's main contributions. So anyway, it puts the person on this roller coaster of glycemia. And every time it comes down, hunger wants to push it back up again. And so, yeah, I, I cut you off though, but that puts them in a position to eat six or seven times a day. And if they're not eating, they're drinking something sugary, either a soda or a sugary fruit juice. Right. And and the difference between, you know, this sugary type of like breakfast you're talking about and perhaps like some, some of this more of a complex carbohydrate would be the fiber is slowing that glucose response oh, sure. and, and causing some satiety as well. Um, so that would be something that you yeah. would contrast. Not to mention Perhaps even in that study in 2021, they probably were doing more complex carbohydrates and not. They were. Yeah. Not, and it was it was plant based. And that that's, again, another reason why I thought we need to be careful. Not I don't mean to sound overly critical of the study. I appreciate it. But at the same time, I think we need to um, elaborate on the limitations, which is most people aren't starting with a breakfast of a big leafy green salad. Um, but there is an, a group uh, that found that when you have a breakfast and they looked at breakfast and the name of the article was something like a more rapid return of hunger. They it was something like return to hunger was in the title. And if the breakfast isocaloric breakfast, so same number of calories, protein was clamped and it just differed in the ratio of fats to carbs. The high carb group was hungrier much sooner and then ate more for their next meal than the low carb group. And, and so I would say, as much as we want to be sort of fair with whole plants, if that breakfast is a mix of whole plants with good proteins and fats, that's going to be a winning combination of satiety and then have a nice lunch. And then my view for me personally, I don't eat breakfast as much as I said, I wouldn't elaborate on my own inter uh, approach. I eat a big lunch. Um, that's my main meal of the day because I want, and then I find if I have a big filling lunch, it's easy for me to taper through dinner and then easy to not snack in the evening. But as much as I know, one of the great ironies of being a metabolic scientist and yet a fallible human, um, with bad habits sometimes is 
that evening time is still my weakest time of the day. And my kids think that I'm the best dad in the world and I want them to be healthy and I don't really bring a lot of cereal into the home. I make breakfast for the kids every morning for the most part. And it's a mix of various meals that I make. And they think, wow, my dad just loves me so much. Yes, I do. I love you all my little darling babies, but I do it because I don't want cereal in the home. Because if there's cereal in the home, daddy is a meth addict when it comes to cereal. And if it's there, as much as I know, I will like go through this, I, I can almost script it out where I'll put help get the kids to bed, I'll clean the house, straighten things up, and then everything's quiet. And then I think I, I need six bowls of cereal right now. There's this little shoulder angel telling me, oh, but you know, you're not going to stop at one bowl. But then there's the addiction side of me saying, yeah, I am. I want this. I'm just going to have one bowl. I never. My wife can, though. My wife has this uncanny, alien-like ability to eat something like this, something sweet, like an ice cream or a cereal, and just have a little bit of it and be done. I can't do that. She is a moderator, and I am an addict when it comes to these kinds of things, which is one of the reasons why I don't love a lot of the modern, the most popular modern mantra when it comes to nutrition is moderation in all things. What if you can't moderate? Then it would be better not to even start. What if you're, what if you eat dinner early? Is it as awesome critical? way to do it too? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. That would be another way to do it. It's just, I, I don't focus on dinner so much because it's just so complicated. You know, you and I, yeah. we have families. And so sometimes there are, for me, for me personally, as a busy dad and husband, my, even though I, I'm home for breakfast, the fact that I'm not eating breakfast in the midst of the chaos, mm -hmm. no, it doesn't disrupt the family dynamic at all. The kids are eating, we're talking, and I'm sipping on my cup of yerba mate while we're helping get lunch ready and everything else. It's not at all disruptive. And, and then lunch, I'm at work, I have whatever lunch I'm going to have, and that'll be my biggest meal of the day. But as much as I am absolutely a fan of, of being careful with dinner because the evidence is so supportive of it, I also recognize that it's the trickiest meal because of social dynamics, family dynamics. But insofar as you can eat earlier, then just stop eating. The very best you can do, whether it's drinking some apple cider vinegar or having something bitter in your mouth to um, reduce the sweet cravings, because bitter tastings can reduce sweet cravings, I would say do it. Whatever tool, whatever leveraging you need in the evening to not crave or snack on junk, do it. Great. Yeah. I mean, I probably should have mentioned this earlier when we were talking about the late late, late night snacking, but the, the fact that melatonin shuts down yep. insulin production in the, the pancreatic beta, beta cells is Yeah, hyperglycemia disrupts melatonin too. So even back to the glucose mechanism, um, another reason to not go to bed hyperglycemic is it disrupts the melatonin rhythm uh, at, at the same time. Oh, interesting. So it's like a two-way yeah, thing here. It's an ugly little battle. <laughs> <laughs>